Uh, this is the, uh, the Michael Jones lecture, so it's appropriate that I say something to you about Michael. I'll come over here. Uh, I didn't have the, uh, the good fortune to, to meet Michael that I recall, but uh, uh, I do know about him because the contributions that he made to criminal law and to civil liberties throughout Australia are well known. He was a Northern Territory practitioner for many years, a very generous man, and a courageous and independent practitioner of law. And those are all important qualities, especially in dark times. And he uh, saw many of those difficult issues uh, in the Northern Territory. Not only did he and his team represent large numbers of persons in difficult circumstances, legally and politically, uh, but he also took on uh, causes uh, that were hard to embrace. One of those was the appointment of a Chief Magistrate in the Northern Territory for just a short period, which was a, uh, uh, an issue that had the potential significantly to erode judicial independence. Uh, he fought that practice, and he fought it successfully, leading to a change in the law in the Northern Territory, and uh, the prospect that such appointments will not be made more regularly uh, throughout Australia. So it really is an honour to uh, speak at this erosion. My predecessors, uh, Michael Kirby and John Petrilla, uh, are persons whom I'm sure you know and who are, are very fine contributors in their different ways to legal thinking and practice at an international level. So those things said, I'm going to talk to you about some current issues uh, in civil liberties. And yes, I am going to talk about two Latinate expressions. And this is a challenge because I'm going to try to establish to you that familiarity, not just with the expressions and their pronunciation, uh, but with the substance of them, uh, is really important. Because uh, to be an effective trial or appellate practitioner in law, uh, one needs to be able to draw upon a reserve of knowledge about the conceptual underpinnings of the law. And some of that is theoretical, and some of it is real day-to-day -day stuff in terms of uh, communicating with people and advocating on their behalf. And that's what uh, Michael Jones did so well. But it's also thinking creatively about how to secure outcomes which are effective for people. Ones which address the real issues that lead them to enter into the criminal justice system and to try to secure consequences which will be the best possible in the circumstances and it's often it often needs to be conceptualized that way because the outcomes are not going to be too good and one tries to optimize uh, the circumstances in difficult conditions so why talk about habeas corpus and parents patriae. Well, let's think about civil liberty protections such as we have them in Australia. We're all acutely conscious that there are limitations for us in that regard. We are a, a constitutional monarchy. Uh, we don't have uh, the amendments to our constitution uh, or the, uh, the entrenched rights that a great many other countries do and there's no real prospect that we're going to secure them. Uh, in the short or probably even medium term. That's the unpalatable reality. And, uh, and that means that uh, there are limited uh, forms of entrenched protection. There are a handful in the Constitution, but uh, at a day-to-day -day level, those are not terribly efficacious. There are uh, charters of human rights and freedoms in Victoria and in the ACT, but they're more symbolic than genuinely efficacious. They allow applications to the Supreme Court for a declaration of inconsistency between a particular provision or procedure and human rights as articulated in those pieces of legislation. They've got an embarrassment value for a government, but it's only modest. And in terms of really changing and entrenching human rights consciousness, it's hard to say that they've been awfully successful thus far. So what does that leave? Uh, for us. Well, there's not a lot of statutory protection otherwise in the form of pieces of legislation to protect uh, human rights. And that leaves judges. And judges uh, have different approaches to doing what they do. 
uh, they, uh, there has only thus far been relatively limited protection to human rights accorded by the courts, by judges who are more independently minded than some or more creatively oriented than others, and sometimes ones who are inspired by principles of human rights jurisprudence, including jurisprudence imported from elsewhere. There's potential for that, and I want to talk to you about that. But I also want to talk about those options that exist within our jurisprudential framework, hence the Latinate expressions, old and important principles which can be and latterly have been harnessed uh, to provide protection to persons uh, who are vulnerable. Let me make things uh, as topical as I can. Uh, let's just think of some of the awful issues which we do have, and I'll stay away from party political things in Queensland, but um, let's just remember what is probably the greatest embarrassment that we have internationally, uh, the state of our Indigenous peoples. I won't talk about the health rates, although they're in many ways worse than the uh, incarceration rates. But let's just look at these, and the numbers really do speak for themselves. In Canada, 3% of the uh, population is Indigenous. 12% of the jail population is. Not good. And they're very aware of it and endeavouring to do things. And you'll hear soon that there have been articulations of protection and mitigation in terms of sentencing for the Indigenous peoples of Canada. In New Zealand, nice and up to date. The Canadian figures are up to date too, by the way. In 2012, 15.4% of the population is Maori. 51% of the jail population is Indigenous. So it's, a, it's an appalling figure of which they're rightfully extremely embarrassed. It is reflective of genuine and pervasive problematic social issues in New Zealand. What about Australia? 2.5% of our population as of 2012 was Indigenous. But 27% of our population uh, are in prisons is Indigenous. Note the differential between 2.5 and 27%. It's a truly staggering and shaming, shameful figure. That will rise to over 30% on my uh, calculations within about two years. It's got no parallel, really, uh, uh, anywhere that's comparable to us. So just recently, two cases went up to the High Court and were decided just a couple of weeks ago, arguing in favour of Canadian jurisprudence, which has articulated uh, an interesting approach to sentencing of Indigenous Canadian peoples. These were the two propositions that were advanced on behalf of Bugmi and Munda, based upon Canadian decisions within a Canadian framework. First, that those who sentence should take into account explicitly as a mitigating factor the unique circumstances of all Indigenous offenders. And that was framed as being relevant to their moral culpability in the individual instance. Second, that they should take into account the high rates of incarceration, to which I've just directed your attention. And that was said to be uh, responsive to and appropriate arising from the history of dispossession and associated forms of disadvantage for our Indigenous persons, as it is in Canada. Well, the appeals failed, and the Australian High Court was emphatic that it was not prepared to incorporate these factors. And they've said that sentencing in every instance is an individualised obligation, and here are some of the things which the court has said in uh, 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 judgments which are to all intents and purposes on this, in this respect unanimous. They've acknowledged the problems of our Indigenous persons in many parts of Australia in growing up in environments which are uh, pervaded by violence and uh, alcohol abuse. And they've conceded that such a background may compromise the person's capacity to mature and to learn from experience. And that those sorts of problems uh, have a long affecting impact upon people. But they've said that an offender's deprived background does not have the same relevance for everybody. And the justice that is accorded must be 
responsive to the particular offender and the particular offending. They've acknowledged that the deprived circumstances of many people's background, particularly our Indigenous people's background, may explain their recourse to violence when frustrated and may impact upon levels of moral culpability. But they've said that this can be a two-edged sword in terms of a plea and mitigation because it may heighten the concern that a court may have in terms of protecting the community from that person's conduct in the future. So they have rejected the Canadian approach emphatically and they've said that to do otherwise would be to fail to accord justice uh, to victims. And it would be to stigmatise our Indigenous peoples and to provide a two-level system of justice within Australia. It's a controversial judgment, a pair of judgments. They're judgments which everyone with any interest in criminal law in Australia must read and absorb and be prepared to apply in an, a creative way uh, in cases involving sentencing, both for Indigenous offenders and for others. But at another level, what we have in this judgment is another aspect of potential mitigation of sentence in terms of imprisonment being taken away from uh, deeply stigmatised and disadvantaged Indigenous peoples. This is the kind of case that Michael Jones would have championed uh, to the High Court. And it leaves those representing Indigenous persons in a difficult situation. The, uh, the case is not revolutionary in its articulation of principle, but in terms of effectively utilising the desperately adverse lifestyle circumstances of many offenders in Queensland, the Northern Territory, Western Australia, South Australia especially, uh, it makes it that little bit harder. So, why is judicial responsiveness to these sorts of issues so limited in Australia? Well, the first of the persons who gave these lectures, uh, Michael Kirby, was assailed uh, from so many quarters for being an activist in terms of his lawmaking from the bench. And that is one of the more opprobrious things that can be said against the judge, that they are not confining themselves to that which they are qualified and appointed to do, but instead are engaging on uh, free-ranging attempts at judicial law reform. Most judges are very keen to uh, avoid that kind of uh, accusation. So that leaves the role to legislatures, and we can see how legislatures uh, deal with protecting uh, or augmenting uh, the civil liberties of persons, and you know that very well, uh, coming from the current Queensland environment. But it does have to be said that the whole civil liberties task is always one of balancing rights and advantages and disadvantages. And the Bugby and Munda cases are very good illustrations of that because the offending in which both of the males involved engaged was unpleasant indeed. One was the manslaughter of a long-term partner uh, in circumstances that were absolutely appalling and undoubtedly alcohol fueled and undoubtedly impacted upon by the very adverse uh, family circumstances of the offender. The other was a very aggressive eruption into unpleasant violence within a custodial environment where injuries that were uh, uh, permanent were inflicted upon a jail officer and not a whit of remorse was demonstrated by the offender. Now, the victims of both of those deserve to have their dignity and their rights respected as well. It's not a one-way street. And it is essential that our courts do that which they can to recognise the state of, uh, of sexual uh, and physical violence visited upon Indigenous women and children.
as well as properly taking into account the circumstances in which that occurs by way of mitigation of the moral culpability of at least some offenders who are Indigenous. And as well, those who have the misfortune to have the job of running and looking after the prisons must be protected. So they have civil liberties as well. But we can say that law and order politics have the greatest community traction at the moment. And the outcome is that imprisonment rates are rising quite spectacularly now in Australia and have been for a few years and will do more in the next five. And that the biggest benefactors or biggest recipients of increased uh, law and order policies and imprisonment will be Indigenous persons. So this does cast some emphasis and some significance upon those ancient protections that exist in our legal system. And I, I thought it might be interesting to just talk about two of them and to talk about some efforts that have been made creatively to deal with some issues of manifest encroachment upon civil liberties in recent times. So let me start with the parents' patriae jurisdiction. We'll go to habeas corpus writs and then uh, reflect just a little bit about remedies that can still be pursued in a creative way. So I'm not going to get too technical about any of this. Well, the parents' patriae jurisdiction is truly ancient. It's one that, uh, that made its way uh, by way of royal prerogative into the, uh, the courts of chancery, the equity courts, a very long time ago. I'm going to refer you to some of the major cases in the UK, Canada uh, and Australia about the parents' patriarch jurisdiction, but it's, it's really a core and jealously guarded preserve of the courts to dispense fairness and justice to look after persons who are seriously disadvantaged by, from a variety of causes. And that might be their youth, or it might be mental illness, intellectual disability, or similar. Now this jurisdiction made its way, as I've said, uh, from a variety of sources into the courts, and uh, the letters patent uh, in the, the relevant documentation granted the courts the care and custody of persons and estates of persons of unsound mind. So quite, quite broad notions, and this is set out by the Canadian Supreme Court. And, and it applies especially also to the well-being of children, and has been so applied a matter of weeks ago uh, in Victoria. And uh, the obligation is for the court to assume responsibility where it is not adequately vested in someone else or some other process. And it should be administered in a way which is characterised by wisdom, affection and carefulness. It should be hallmarks of the care provided by patient parents to their children. It's not a bad combination actually, is it? Wisdom, affection and, and care. One of the early cases, not all that early in this kind of context, but uh, at any rate not too far from 200 years old now, cases in the UK, uh, framed it in terms of the courts having this jurisdiction that was inherent to them to do that which they need to do for the benefit of those who are incompetent in this very broad sense. And it's been found even as long ago as this case, uh, now what is it, 186 years ago, that it, it is very broad in terms of what, how it can find expression in orders of a court. The theta being that that done must be necessary for the protection, or interestingly the education, uh, of those who are the subject matter of the orders. Here's an, an old book now that uh, theorised about the, uh, the backgrounds to the, uh, uh, the, uh, the parents' patriarch jurisdiction. And uh, you can see that it, it had mixed backgrounds and that some of its origins are lost in the, the mists of time. And Sir Edward Coke, now 400, year, uh, what's it, 400 years ago, yes, uh, talked about uh, 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 idiots and fools natural for whom there's no expectation. Bit of a sad uh, <laughs> uh, sentence, isn't it? Um, but uh, it, it allows the law to do that which it can uh, for them. So in Reeve, the, uh, which was a Canadian case, reached the uh, Supreme Court of Canada uh, uh, in terms of sterilisation of persons with intellectual disabilities. 
uh, the, uh, the court emphasised that it has a broad application. And likewise in the uh, United Kingdom, that breadth was recognised and what the court said was, taking that into account, we've got to be very careful with how we administer it because otherwise it can outgrow its parameters and become an opportunity for us to do more than what we really ought to do. Nonetheless, it is able to be invoked whenever a court is satisfied that the welfare of a child requires something to be done in respect of the rights which otherwise a parent might have. In New South Wales, just, uh, just latterly, to give a flavour of how it's administered today, the Director <coughs> General of the Department of uh, Community Services was able to obtain Supreme Court orders in respect of a boy who was 16 to confine him indefinitely in a secure unit and to enable administration of medication. So, think about that. Why am I raising that case? Because this looks like a dreadful encroachment upon rights, doesn't it? The 16-year-old uh, the is being confined and, and coercively provided with medication. But one of the things that emerges from these cases is that often the absence of those kinds of steps results in one major risk for the individual involved, but also for others and a lifestyle that is dreadful by reason of ungoverned uh, psychiatric disorders or capacity uh, to behave in a way which is uh, amenable to group living. And that was the situation in Thomas. Likewise, the parents' patriarch jurisdiction has been utilised in England in relation to a provision of coerced treatment for a person with anorexia nervosa, the court acknowledging that what she wanted was relevant, but not determinative. So here we have a classic situation where there is a conflict between a benevolent jurisdiction of the court to do that which is required for enhancing and protecting the well-being and circumstances of a person otherwise not able to make very good decisions by reason of their youth or their psychiatric disorder or their intellectual disability or their brain injury. But almost inevitably that means the, uh, the, uh, the enforcement of coercion, which at a level, as Susie O'Toole would take it because of work she's done, is deleterious. The more one uses force against people who, uh, uh, who already are deprived of some of their rights, the more counter-therapeutic it often is. And this is a very familiar dichotomy within uh, human rights discourse that is informed and nuanced. One of our most important uh, and influential cases in the last 30 years from the High Court is Marion's case which is another of these cases dealing with uh, the power of a court to mandate the taking of a permanent procedure against a person uh, who is young. And that might be a sterilisation procedure or it might be something else which will have long-term consequences uh, to the person. And in this case, the High Court gave authorisation for such a procedure in respect of a child and it did so in the exercise of uh, the parents' patriarch jurisdiction. Just recently, in a case in which, uh, which I was involved, in uh, the full court of the family court was called upon to, ref to apply Marianne's case in respect of a child who wanted to change gender. But the administration of the necessary drugs around the time of puberty was a reasonably final exercise. The parents and the child and the clinicians all were inclined in respect of a 10 year old child to authorise two phases of the drugs en route to complete sex change. Now you can, you can see immediately what difficult civil liberties issues arise in respect of so permanent and profound a change being wrought in respect of a child uh, for whom there was no ambiguity uh, hormonally in respect of their gender. 
and what was said was that the child had a, a gender identity disorder that was profound and had manifested from a very early age. I had a very interesting brief in this. I was briefed by the public advocate to intervene and urge the court to show restraint and not to accept what everyone otherwise was unanimously recommending because of the complexity of the circumstances and to urge the full court of the family court to authorise the first step based on all the medical advice but to hold off on the second and revisit the matter when the time arose, recognising that so much can change for a child between the ages of say 10 and 16 and that's what the full court ended up being persuaded to do. But these cases in terms of exercise of the Marian parents patriarch jurisdiction in fact are really complex and just as in respect of Bugby and Munda one needs not just to focus upon the civil liberties of the offender but also those of the uh, of, of others at risk previously or, uh, or in the future so too there are real complexities and balancing issues uh, for the exercise of the parents patriarch jurisdiction but it's alive and well and being invoked in New South Wales, Justice Austin uh, utilised it in respect of uh, a uh, child uh, with anorexia nervosa. And just this very year, in a, in a, a, a complex decision, uh, uh, the parents' patriarch jurisdiction was utilised in relation to a 16-year-old girl with intellectual disabilities. She had a range of, uh, of, of very self-destructive behaviours and lashed out also at those who were endeavouring to care for her. Already the department had guardianship and custody in respect of her, but the question arose as to how, how much they could confine her accommodation and uh, the extent to which lawfully they could impose uh, locked arrangements upon her uh, in her own best interests. Now those are always, that's always a very dangerous set of terminology. Uh, that in best interests, of course, can be paternalistic, uh, it can be managerialist and it can fail to have regard to the exercise of autonomy and decision making generally by a person with a level of disability. And the case was decided in the shadow of the Victorian Charter of Human Rights and Freedom and Responsibilities uh, and the United Nations Convention in respect of uh, disability. So it's a very interesting decision. Ultimately, the, uh, the court uh, did decide uh, to, uh, to grant uh, what was uh, sought. And so you have the, uh, the situation that in the outcome, as with remarrying, an appellate court made a decision after scrutinising all of the evidence through a human rights lens, deciding in the exercise of its parents' patriarch jurisdiction that this was the outcome that was best for the vulnerable young person. Now, a raw civil libertarian perspective, uninformed by nuance, would denounce that as an appalling decision. But it is a complex scenario. Let me move to the habeas corpus area. So we've done one Latin area. Let's move to a second. And let's go back to the, uh, uh, the, the Magna Carta. It uh, does date back all the way to 1297. And here's the uh, 39th clause of the Magna Carta. And uh, that book, which is uh, shown up at the top, is a fascinating book about uh, the history of the, uh, the Magna Carta that was published a couple of years ago. So you can see uh, that uh, within this clause is the background to key provisions in the International Convention on Civil and Political Rights and the United Nations Convention on Human Rights and charters here and so many other human rights instruments of the last 50 years, dating all the way back to 1297. No free man, unfortunately this did not include slaves, shall be taken or imprisoned or, or deceased from their freehold or liberties or customs or outlawed or exiled or otherwise destroyed. So major inhibition. Nor will we pass upon him or condemn him, but by lawful judgment of his peers or by law of the land. Will sell to no man, will not deny or defer to any man, either justice or right. It's old language, but it's powerful uh, language in terms of rights and entitlements. And it dates back to the 13th century. 
and you can see in here the rights to both freedom and liberty and also to due process through the courts. So that's the background of, uh, of habeas corpus. And that's why William Blackstone, so much later, but still a long time ago, described it as the great bulwark of our constitution, a great and efficacious writ. Now what it does is to mandate at Ordinaisi time that a person be brought to court so that the lawfulness of their detention can be evaluated on the basis of proper evidence by a court. And it means that the propriety of a person being confined in a workhouse in days gone by, or an insane asylum, these days in a psychiatric hospital, or a juvenile justice centre, or a place where doors are locked for the intellectually disabled or those with brain injuries can be ruled upon and there can be determination of the propriety by reference to processes of law. Here's a very interesting case which was decided just three years ago. It's Justice Bell who was the decision maker in, a, in what's quite a landmark human rights decision in this country. It involved a woman who was 33 years of age. She was involuntary in the sense that she was a mandated outpatient, which we often call being on a community treatment order. And when you're on a community treatment order, you have to submit to treatment, uh, which can, it's often pharmacotherapy, with a variety of effects that come from antipsychotic medication or whatever. Uh, you have to turn up for assessment, and you pretty much have to do what the clinicians say you have to do for a stipulated period of time. So it's a major encroachment on your freedom of movement and decision making and so on. And the criteria for it relates to you having a psychiatric disorder and it being necessary for the protection of yourself or others. That's pretty much the set of criteria we have right around Australia. Now this, uh, uh, in respect to some of these community treatment orders, there can be an extra requirement that the person live in a particular place. And for those who are very unwell and just not able to take their medication reliably, Sometimes this kind of residential condition is imposed that they live in a community care unit with others with similar disorders where there is administration of what they do and oversight and thereby it becomes known when they're taking their medication or not and if they're not, breach proceedings can be taken. They're taken back to hospital, stabilised once again on their medication. But this woman didn't have a residential condition but the psychiatrist in a what may well have been a sensible thing, uh, approach, I, it's hard to say, uh, said to her that she was not allowed to live at home with her mother. That that was no good and that she had to live in this community care unit. But that was not what she wanted. She wanted to be with her mother. And there was no residential condition. And it had passed through the Mental Health Review Board in terms of oversight on more than one occasion. And finally a creative set of lawyers, took this matter to uh, the decision-making body and had a Supreme Court judge sit upon it, and, this, and the Supreme Court judge issued a writ of habeas corpus and confirmed it, because this requirement encroached upon her liberties in a way which was not lawfully authorised. Now the truth was that she could have simply walked out of the community care unit and gone to her mother's, but interestingly his honour accepted that in a real and meaningful and real world sense, she wasn't able to do that by virtue of the orders from the psychiatrist. And so granted habeas corpus, even though the doors were not locked upon her. So it's quite a landmark decision, really revivifying and energising the ancient writ. In, uh, in the United Kingdom, probably the main case of, of, of this sort in recent times involved a person by the name of H.L. Who, uh, who had a uh, severe autistic uh, disorder and uh, was pretty ungovernable in terms of, uh, of conduct and was self-harming and harming to others. Now here's the interesting situation. This person, after a lot of to and fro, was placed in the unit and classified as an informal patient and they couldn't leave. They were meant to be an involuntary patient fulfilling the requirements of involuntariness as an inpatient but like a lot of people who have dementia or brain injuries or intellectual disabilities, they were just quietly placed informally in this place with no means of egress. In due course, action was taken 
under the shadow of the European Human Rights Convention to test the lawfulness of this kind of designation. And it was found by the European Court that it was unlawful. In other words, they, uh, Strasbourg said to England, if you want the doors closed on this person, go through the appropriate processes, have them made an involuntary inpatient if they satisfy the criteria which can be oversighted by the Mental Health Tribunal. Otherwise, you cannot close doors upon them. It's a very significant decision in the UK. It's forced, it, it created some significant <coughs> measure of administrative havoc and uh, has changed practices quite profoundly because there is a whole population out there of people uh, who are here too <coughs> the subject of informal uh, classification uh, without the rights and entitlements that go with the lawful imposition of involuntary sta uh, status. So there's the process of, uh, of habeas corpus applying to a whole variety of persons whose uh, rights of movement are encroached upon by those purporting to do so lawfully and where they can be questioned and evaluated so that the propriety of these kinds of encroachments on civil liberty can be tested. And we know now that the law is still developing, even after 1297, so that de facto <coughs> encroachments can attract the remedy and invoke the jurisdiction of the superior courts. So it's alive and still functioning and subject to invocation in a range of circumstances. Well, what other situations can we see civil liberties as subject of creative remedial orders? Here's an interesting scenario uh, which was played out in Canada now a little while ago, but uh, which was the subject of uh, comparable challenge in Australia. The, those representing a prisoner in one of the Canadian jails challenged the lawfulness of the conditions in which the person was being held. And the Supreme Court accepted that there was no reason why they should be confined in a special handling unit, which is essentially uh, in isolation, uh, could be justified. And they accepted that habeas corpus could be utilised for that purpose. Well, that attracted an attempt to do the same in, uh, in New South Wales. I'm not sure it was a terribly meritorious case as a vehicle, because what was argued was that the failure to supply a variety of prisoners with, was con with condoms was unreasonable and should be subjected to uh, habeas corpus. Now that's really pushing the boundaries of habeas corpus to breaking point and that was exactly what the Supreme Court judge uh, determined. Uh, and, uh, but problematically unfortunately in Australia, and this may well be able to be revisited, uh, the court said that habeas corpus extended to confinement per se but not to the circumstances of it. Now that's inconsistent with the approach in Canada and it may well be able to be revisited. It was just that unfortunately probably the, uh, the law in Australia was set back by a case being chosen infelicitously which wasn't a good vehicle for such a challenge. But let me just say a few words to you about uh, what I think is the most significant human rights decision in recent times and it will surprise you to hear it came from the United States. Uh, it, the, uh, the issue of prisoner overcrowding is a big political issue in Australia at the moment and it's even worse in the United States and most particularly in California where the numbers of prisoners being held in correctional uh, facilities is obscene and the conditions in which they're held are truly appalling. And this is an issue both in terms of persons with physical illnesses and uh, psychiatric disorders. This issue went to the Supreme Court in circumstances which are quite complex and I won't go into the subtleties of them, but the contention that was advanced before the Supreme Court was that uh, persons with a variety of disorders were not receiving minimal adequate care, that the outcome was suicides and uh, harsh and unreasonable conditions in jail. And the Supreme Court by majority accepted that argument and issued a truly extraordinary order to California. 
that they reduce the habitation in correctional centres in California to 137.5% of design capacity. Now you might think, well, that's not all that good an outcome. But the, uh, the numbers who were in those facilities were so dramatically more than 137% before that, that it is a revolutionary uh, order from the court. This gives you a bit of a flavour because there are, um, there are actually pictures uh, uh, attached to the end of a judgement. And when you look at these pictures, you start to understand what we're talking about in terms of dormitory style uh, incarceration in the United States. This is what it's like to be in a Californian prison. Double bunked, massive numbers of prisoners to a room. You can imagine what kind of outcomes that has. And if somebody's unwell or they need to be sequestered, this is how it's done. They, can, uh, they can't even stretch out. So the conditions are just hideous. But the uh, Supreme Court did intervene to endeavour to stop it. Now, I understand that it's unlikely that the orders are being operationalised, or will be, in California. But nonetheless, in terms of an enunciation of principle and a determination that it's been a breach of the Eighth Amendment entitlements to uh, reasonable conditions of imprisonment, it's a very, very potent uh, symbolic declaration by the United States Supreme Court. The challenge, of course, after that is for the second and third phase litigation to try and do something about it. Uh, when there are suicides that are about to take place, when illnesses are not picked up and are not treated and there are adverse consequences. Now that the Supreme Court has issued these edicts, when the practices continue, much of, uh, of what is taking place is technically probably unlawful and subject to a whole range of second and third phase remedies. And maybe bit by bit, uh, the leverage of the law and the administration of tortious and other remedies may be able to improve conditions in the prisons. I really do not rule out this sort of uh, issue in Australia, uh, in uh, the state from which I mostly practice in Victoria. Uh, the situation has been reached now where uh, prisoners cannot be brought into court uh, from uh, police cells because the overcrowding in the central remand facilities is so extreme. And any day now, I or one other of the, uh, the silks interested in these sorts of issues will be briefed to go to the Supreme Court and, uh, and seek uh, remedial uh, decisions from the Supreme Court about the unlawfulness of continued detention in circumstances of a manifest breach of people's human rights. So I wanted to, uh, to just draw these threads together for you. I hope I've succeeded in showing to you that some, there is a, an ongoing relevance to these Latinate phrases, that the parents' patriae jurisdiction remains an important, potentially abused aspect of our legal system, but an aspect which is invoked and applied, uh, generally in a way which protects the complex rights of those who are the subject to the orders. And, and much the same in respect of habeas corpus, which you can see still is a, a vibrant and important remedy. It's not just some technical thing in a civil procedure book, it's a real, genuine, alive way of protecting uh, civil liberties and human rights. And the potential exists for other mechanisms to achieve the same objective. For instance, uh, there are communications to the United Nations Human Rights Committee. We've had a number of those which have come out of Australia. There's been one just recently in respect of a, a child who was shot dead by four police in Victoria. And the mother uh, has taken a communication, as they're called, to the Human Rights Committee, uh, arguing that the investigation into her son's death was inadequate by reason of police being involved, and of course police being the ones who fire weapons, and a range of subsidiary creative arguments. And what the Human Rights Committee will make of all that remains to be seen. What's the outcome? Well, the, uh, the Human Rights Committee can make, in essence, a declaration of breach of human rights based upon Australia being a signatory to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And then it's up to Australia whether it does anything about it. Now, the background of Australia's response to these sorts of things over the last decade has been the one. But nonetheless, these things build up. And what, what is said internationally in all sorts of forums when there is a, an escalating body of decision-making from respected international authorities, 
is that Australia does not accord proper rights and freedoms to its citizens, Indigenous and non-Indigenous. And little bit by little bit, the pressure grows for appropriate responsiveness if we're to be part of the community of civilised nations in which human rights are respected. It's a long, slow process, but sometimes recognising that and being part of it is a constructive way to contribute to the valuing of human rights and the valuing of uh, dignity and autonomy within our country. And so it's little bit by little bit, by the utilisation of the kinds of remedies that are sometimes ancient and sometimes novel, by creative lawyering, informed by a human rights perspective, that courageous persons such as Michael Jones have been able to contribute to the civil liberties fabric of our law. And people like Michael are needed more than ever right now in days which are dark and difficult for civil liberties of persons both Indigenous and non-Indigenous in Australia. So I hope that that may have interested you in some of those sorts of issues. And you're very kind to have spent an hour with me listening. Thank you.